You're right there. Yeah. I'll hang around. All right. Let's see it. So we're just about ready to get back. And before we get started, because Anna made a brief disclosure, I'm going to make one as well. Um, in my work, there has been much made about my real estate practice. And um, I have, it's been mentioned that I had four transactions reported last year. And the only person I have any real estate business with is Brandy Pennington right here with Pennington Brokerage. And so um, if there's ever any question about transactions or whatnot, there's a face to the name when I make those disclosures in the future. So it's the only person I've had any business with in three years. But thank you for being here, Brandon. So um, with that, I am going to move us now to the industry panel. And this panel is going to um, include, again, Tyler Robinson of Cook Valley Housing Authority, Andre Spinelli of Spinell Homes, and Mike Robbins of ACA, and Brandon Mark, I mentioned with Triad. And I'm really glad you could be here, Brandon. To start, we will have each of you um, I'm going to ask questions, I guess, and um, each of you will have two to three minutes to answer. Um, this is supposed to be kind of a high-level conversation, 30,000 foot, and um, broad strokes. And we'll save the granular conversations, the detail for future sessions as we work towards the summit. Um, very good. So, and again, if you're viewing this on the live stream, a reminder that all the materials that we'll share today will be found online at www.muni.org slash assembly and then click on the housing button. Okay, so um, starting with Brandon, it's fresh voice. What are the highlights and unexpected barriers from recent work? Two periods. Uh, thank you. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Um, you want to pull that map? Yeah. Um, I'm going to have a, a quick map pulled up as an example. And I was basically going to ride Tyler's coattails off of his last statement. Um, it, it's not unexpected, it's kind of a standard occurrence, but offsite improvements, I would say, are the most um, cost prohibitive um, issue with new developments uh, in town. So here's an example uh, recently from as many as just a couple weeks ago. We we're working on a project at the south end of Rovina Street. Can you turn off the, oh, uh, if I can show you right here. It's this parcel right here. Previously developed with a single family home, it's got a driveway extended down to the south end of it, and client wants to subdivide it and create three uh, duplex style lots. And uh, immediately we identified that offsite improvements were going to be a problem. So we talked to the planning department, said, hey, we need a pre application meeting to talk about this. Uh, they responded saying, no need to talk about it. We've already looked at this lot many times. Uh, you'll have half street improvement standards, lighting requirements, and water main extension requirements. Um, there you go. We'll talk to you later. Um, thankfully, we recognize that um, through the platting process, if we're going to ask for a variance that turns into a long plat, it requires a pre application meeting. So we actually kind of dug our uh, uh, dug the knife in them a little bit and said, hey, we need a pre application meeting to talk about this. The, the improvement standards that they're requiring through code. Um, when, so when you subdivide new property, code basically states you have to upgrade off-site roads or access roads to your property. Mm -hmm. The improvements that they were asking for would total somewhere in the neighborhood of $350,000. And when you look at this development and you say, okay, I want to create three lots, and now I have to build a road, I have to build one half of this road that fronts this property. And you can tell where we're at, it's uh, Diamonds to the south, Arctic's to the east. Uh, you, you can see Campbell River's right there, Campbell Creek's right there. This road's not gonna be extended. The owner across the street to the east already lives there. The house is developed. There's no, nobody's gonna be developing the other half of this road. And the starting position of the city is you gotta build one half the street. And this is gonna immediately add $350,000 to the project, which is, well over a hundred thousand dollars per lot in improvements and so we we met with the city talking about it and illustrated that point many times saying hey you're you're instantly adding six figures to each lot probably making this project undevelopable we already have to extend a water main 
to the south end of this project to serve it. That's a requirement by code with AWW. We can't get out of that one. We need to figure out other ways to cut out improvements. Um, thankfully, we've been working with staff. They've been kind of seeing uh, where we're coming from. They've started to uh, look at a lesser standard uh, for us to develop this project to. But that's the starting position when you go into the planning department. Any developer, any landowner, uh, anybody that comes to us probably once or twice a week, we meet with individuals that sit down and they, they, they put their piece of property on the desk and say, what do we do with this? The offsite improvements are probably the first biggest hindrance to doing any type of development there. And the problem is too, if you don't know the process, you don't know the system, you don't know the ways to work through and, and reduce those standards, the answer that you get, and this is no fault of planning, this is just the way the code reads. You know, you go to the planning department, you say, what do I do with this? They say, build a road. And, you know, six figures for, for three lots in, in that part of town, you know, that's the, not million dollar home neighborhood. I, you know, I used to live to the north for many years. And, you know, you want to talk about a, a, attainable housing, that's the fastest way to do it, is get rid of the offsite improvements. You can look at this and say, hey, there's a 20 foot driveway there. It's probably good for three homes, call it a day. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know how to fill three minutes. So, um, Next, I'm going to ask Andre, and thank you for that, Brandon, um, to answer the same question of what are the highlights and unexpected barriers we face from recent work? And they, they have bolded the, the word unexpected barriers, so maybe that's what they really want to hear. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just reiterate some of the stuff I've already said, and that's, that's timelines. Um, things that are called for in our plan that are not supported by our code, um, they, they add drastic amount of time to a project, and time is money, um, and money costs twice as much as it used to cost. So I think that's the biggest thing that I've seen, and I could go on and on and with examples, but I'll just leave that now. So I think though, you have another minute or two. They want a specific example. Like, give us a, a specific example of a headache you had. Just one. <laughs> um, specific, specific example of a headache I currently have is I have property that I want to rezone to something that the 2040 plan doesn't necessarily support. And the 2040 plan, I would say, is probably in error in my specific location because it kind of, it's, you know, there's, you take the whole city and you kind of got these, you know, the purple and the pink and the yellow and green and whatever. Um, there's a little section carved out around one of my projects and, and I've been working with the community council for a year on trying to get their support for what I want to rezone the property to, but I still get pushback from the municipality. Um, with that regard. It's kind of a bad example for today because it's more anti-housing than pro-housing, but it's, I guess it's just an example of the kind of the pushback I get. And, and it's not like I haven't seen that on other ones as well. Another example would be a hillside subdivision I developed a year, last year had a water line that I was required to install because traffic and fire were very concerned with the safety for this area of the hillside. And so if I was going to get my 27 lots on 40 acres approved, I needed well, providing fire water was how I was able to obtain approval. Just this year, the planning board allowed a seven lot subdivision, you know, within 500 feet of me to be approved without that requirement. That's not a big deal to me, but to a smaller developer to allow somebody to come in and offer lots with maybe a, that, that water system might cost me 50 grand a lot. So now I have to compete with a guy who has $50,000 less in requirements. That's just, it's insane to me and it's, it's just wrong. Thanks, you know, that brings to mind something nobody's mentioned today, but we've heard before and that's that first in developer idea where you have a subdivision go in, the developer has to build up to the standards, 
and then it's just a couple of years before someone can come in without all that expense and tie right in to your investment, which creates kind of a stand-up situation. And so that is an area we should explore. Um, I guess, Tyler, you're next. Highlights and barriers. Thanks. I, I read this one as mostly barriers and highlights coming next, so it's not because I'm just looking glass half empty here. Uh, first, I would say I've heard a couple of things. Our model of cooking with housing, obviously, is to bring different subsidy levels together. Sometimes I kind of reading between the lines, I hear people kind of insinuate that that's easy to do, that costs don't matter to us. And what I want to say is two things. One is uh, we compete for these resources around the country and statewide, and every cost that Anchorage adds to a project makes it easier to do affordable housing elsewhere in the state of Alaska. So it's really important that we're, we're all working from the same rules. I think Daniel made that, uh, that point uh, really well. Um, two, uh, uh, kind of an interesting one that came up is like you all, although it sort of caught me by surprise, I too got calls um, with the Girdwood housing situation. And uh, why? Because we build affordable housing. And, and, I, and I talked to some of you as well. And the issue was, hey, um, why, aren't, why aren't we down here uh, building housing? And I, and I bring this example up, and I know it might be time to revisit Bolton Hills. Um, but the problem was not well defined. I really like what Brandon just used the word attainable housing. And I, 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 think, I think it's really important to understand what problem we're trying to solve because it, it matters what tools you bring to solve that problem. I'll leave it at that without going into details, but, but the short answer was it didn't seem like the primary product that we are involved in was the solution that Girdwood needed, nor was it feasible to bring that solution there. And we can get into the whys behind that if we want to. Um, third, I had the opportunity to redevelop uh, Papa Joe's in Spinard under the sort of phrase, you know, all good things must come to an end, or maybe all things must come to an end. Well, we're in the process of redeveloping the Brewster site at Mountain View, so another sort of iconic site that people know at Mountain View Drive and Regatta. And I, for the past 12 years, have been carrying the letters that used to stand on the building, um, from building to building, as we sort of needed to move them around. So those of you that remember, the Brewsters, I lost the apostrophe, but I still have the letters spelling Brewsters and hope to incorporate those um, on a development. You all are investors in that development uh, through some um, CDB, uh, ARPA, ARPA funds, um, but what I will say is the most recent conversations at the planning department with the building that's designed still are back and forth around whether the building is appropriately articulated, in other words, does it meet the design standards, and whether or not our landscaping actually requires a variance or there's flexibility within the landscape code to move some plants around, to not be able to block a community mural, et cetera, et cetera. These things like minor things, but they cost us a ton of money with our design teams. They jeopardize potentially having to redesign projects and they do nothing, I would argue, to result in better quality housing in our community. Uh, and it's time to look at that stuff and make it a lot easier to build, uh, to build multifamily housing. Mike, last up. Thank you. So I'm just going to give you some highlights and examples from, from a couple of different things that we're working on. First of all is the Mount McKinley building downtown on 4th Avenue across from the police station. Um, at the suggestion of uh, then Assembly Member Constant, we embarked on a project to take an empty commercial building and transform it into workforce housing, which we did. We uh, engaged with architect, engaged with, with the building owner, got them all on board. And, and what we've run into now is this housing gap that we've talked about today, which is we were very excited about the fact that we were going to be able to put 40 new housing units there. But, but at the end of the day, if we're going to use them as workforce housing, we're about $4 million short on what we need. And just like with Block uh, 96, you know, ACDA put in 1.8 million in cash plus the land on a very favorable land lease, and that's not a sustainable model. So while private development needs government's help right now, because this problem is, is pretty big, um, the housing issue in Anchorage is big, and so we have to find a way to come alongside and help them. But the McKinley building is one thing. So we were pretty excited about the process. We're not giving up. We're going to move on to another building and try the same process with that building to see if maybe we need to expand the number of units, maybe with the type of construction 
But we're going to find, we're going to figure out the sort of model to make that work because it's working in other communities right now. Then there's the, um, we've been working um, with the, uh, the Clue 8 folks out on the Powder Ridge and Powder West subdivisions. Very excited about that project. And again, I think that this sort of, this sort of a uh, positive, negative glass half full, glass half empty exercise right now, but very excited up to, you know, 850 multifamily housing units in Powder Ridge West. Um, but then we started to run into hurdles with uh, infrastructure. You know, we needed to move infrastructure three blocks to put 850 housing units in. Then we needed a lift station, and which we agreed to cover. But and then there, then it became a political issue uh, with, within the city, and and some things stopping that development. So it's not always the code. In, in, in what I'm trying to demonstrate here is it's not always that there's anything wrong with our code because I don't think that we have a people problem within these. In the, for, for example, over building services, I think we have a process problem which is the processes aren't being executed properly. And so another one is Block 102. Again, very exciting project. We've been working on this for over two years. And we were able to arrange for the land trade between the city and the state. And thanks to the, the excellent work and the partnership that we've been, we formed with the, with the Heritage Land Bank, we've been able to get this to sort of the, the 90, I would say we're kind of at the five yard line on this project. And, and then we're ready to get the land swap done and go in front of the Heritage Land Bank advisory board. But, you know, again, on that project too, that's that's one of those places where we ran into code. Code just stopped us cold for months and months, trying to get this through and trying to get this project through legal. And sometimes, and I again, I don't normally talk like this, but because you wanted to know the uh, barriers, I'm going to share them. <laughs> um, but I, I'm a glass half full guy. But again, um, we couldn't get through our own legal department to the municipality. You know. We just had just had challenges with being able to sort of get out of our own way as a city to be able to make a, a, a trade happen with two willing partners. It's kind of it's kind of like being at a hot dog stand, right? And you got one person who's got the bun and one person who's got the hot dog, and they're both hungry and they want to split it. But you got somebody standing in the middle going, "Yeah, and you can't do that, right?" And we're waving our arms around, keeping them from putting the hot dog together and having a meal. And so we do that sometimes in the city, I think. And so. And, and that's a process problem that we've got. It's not a people problem, you know, and we need to examine that. So, and then Block 96, I have to mention because, you know, it's a very exciting project. And this summer, Sean's gonna bring 48 new units on downtown. Uh, great, he's got a waiting list, it's an excellent project. But here we have a project that uh, did all of the right things. We got involved, we helped bring him, you know, put the project over the top, and then, after he broke ground, our tax assessor sends him a note that says, oh yeah, by the way, that tax credit we were giving you, I don't know if that's not really gonna happen. And, and so now all of a sudden, he costed out his development and he costed it out based on what he had been told. And, uh, and, and as his partner in the development, um, you know, it's frustrating for us because again, we wanna see those things happen. And, and we went to great lengths to facilitate that development, only to have him uh, be unhappy because the city isn't following through on what they offer. And, and again, I think that's one of the other things where we talk about process. It's not the people, it's not that somebody doesn't like Sean, it's that we have a process issue that we have to work on. Thank you. And uh, you know, Mr. Horn, let me, there's an unusual circumstance here. Is there an attorney in the room? Anybody? This is so interesting to me because as a body, we are usually surrounded by attorneys. <laughs> and so um, that's interesting. Do we have you know, some of these points to Jason? But, um, also, I'd note we're, we're, we have Bob Dole from Rasmussen in the room with us as well. And so I will move on to the round two question. And that is, and we'll start with you, Andre. Um, <clears throat> share a recent project or experience that made you feel hopeful or do you have and or do you have upcoming work that you'd like the policymakers to be aware of? Um, I'm sorry I'm not that prepared but I skipped over these questions I can and was had something completely different to say but I can I can wing it. I think the thing I'm most hopeful about is I've been meeting with the assembly and other 
groups interested in housing and even the administration, the planning department, everyone seems to be really motivated to, to make, make some improvements. So I think that's like my number one thing I'm most hopeful about. A project, a current project that I think warrants um, attention would be the sand, AS and G's uh, proposal to expand the height of their sand lake gravel pit. Um, just so everybody knows, similar to the snow dump situation that everyone had, when we run out of places to dump our snow, we have to truck it to a Klutna. Trucking is the most expensive part of, of it altogether. So if we run out of places to put our bad material in Anchorage, we're going to need to truck it somewhere. And that is direct impact to the cost of the home. And so maybe that's not the right place. Maybe it is the right place. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that it's important to have a place for that material to go in order to keep housing prices from rising. Thank you, Andre. Um, moving to your left, Tyler. Again, the question is um, experiences recently that made you hopeful and or upcoming work you'd like us to be aware of. Um, thank you. The the. The triplex, uh, fourplex conversation is really exciting for me. I mean, you'll remember when we did a design competition in Fairview and, and the, the premise was quite simple. How do you do more than two units? Um, if we can add those incremental units and developments that, that don't cost north of $10 million, I think that's a good thing. Um, the other thing, a couple, a couple of years ago, uh, I think two or three years ago, we looked at the uh, building permits. I think, by the way, you all are right to say, like, what is this? where is this data and how do we track this stuff? So as I think about triplex, fourplex, right now it's all modeled in with multifamily stuff. So as we think about these actions and then the results of these actions, we ought to be thinking about how, how are we actually tracking whether the policies we're changing are effective. Um, but on, on that uh, on that note, when, when we uh, when we were looking at the numbers, there were 51 multifamily units permitted in a, in a given year, and I was thinking, oh, we, we did 48 of them uh, in Spinard, and oh wait, we did a triplex around the corner. All 51 of them were ours. That's not what we want as a housing authority. That's not a healthy housing market when you're building one type of housing. When I look at the permits from 2022, there's something in the magnitude of 150, 160 units permitted last year. Um, what excites me about that is, yep, we have a development in there, the second phase of that Spinard project, which is a massive redevelopment. We're excited to get it behind us. We heard from Mike about the downtown development, which anytime we have market rate multifamily, despite how hard it is to do and what the participation is, we ought to celebrate it and learn from it. And the third one is a permanent supportive housing development that Providence is going to own, which is probably the most challenging project, not to pay for, but to operate and to site. And the fact that we have those three types of multifamilies built, you know, same, same building type, they all got an elevator, they're all three or four stories, they serve vastly different populations. That gets me excited. Thank you. And um, next, we'll go to Mike Thomas. Thank you very much. So I think one of the things that got me the most excited this last year was the was the change that you you all made in Title 21 and some of the other zoning, some of the work that you've been doing since the last housing uh, meeting. So that that really showed us at ACDA anyway that that there was um, honest and um, focused work on trying to solve this problem. Um, as I said earlier, I think that this has just gotten too big and that we're going to have to figure out a way to help private sector but the other thing that, that as I also mentioned the McKinley building and these other projects that sort of barriers the McKinley building that concept excites us we're very excited about finding the right formula so that we can turn some of these empty commercial buildings into uh, either workforce or market rate or whatever kind of housing it will bear um, and so that's encouraging and some of the zoning changes I think you've done to help us make that happen and I'm also excited about the occlutina project uh, because I believe that is the closest thing we have to a major shovel ready project that could be in the ground. And, you know, I, I just want to address that we were talking earlier about not acting too quickly because I was here at the pipeline days too. That's when I moved here, right? And, you know, one of the things I think that will keep us from making some of the same mistakes that now that we made then is we try to react to this situation is that we've already made those mistakes and hopefully we'll just have to.
whereas before we didn't have the experience to draw upon. And so I'm confident that we can solve this, but it is going to take action. And we can't just sit around and keep talking about this. And, and again, that's what we're trying to do at ACBA is to cause action, putting our shoulder into the Akutna project that's been talked about for years and trying to get that going by, you know, putting your money and, and just lending our, our uh, support to it. So I think we can solve these problems if we continue to uh, take action. All right, Brandon, your last but not least, um, experiences that made you feel hopeful and upcoming work that you think we might learn about. Um, I would second Mike's comments about Akutna. Um, when I talk to those guys and see that they're getting excited about their power reserve development and starting to uh, pour more attention into it, it gets me very hopeful that this could be a potential solution to the housing problems that we have. You know, minimum, uh, a lot of our subdivisions that we've been working on for years are coming to a close. The West Park's basically phased out. Terraces have been done. Powder Ridge has been done for years. You know, a, a lot of these projects don't have more faces that can be easily brought online. And this big animal that we just need to wrap our arms around it and dive into and get it going. And it makes me hopeful that Clinton is willing to, to dive into it. Um, but I think they need a partner, and I think they need somebody that is equally as excited to solve the problems. Um, I, I spoke about the, the small uh, tract of land you know, off the south end of Rovina. Those same problems exist for Akutna, too. So it, it scales from the small mom-and-pop guys all the way up to the big, the, the big dogs with a lot of land. They have the same exact problems. They have off-site infrastructure issues that need to be tackled uh, with creative solutions that work for everybody. Um, it can't be a one-sided uh, type of uh, type of deal, but uh, that's probably one of the things that makes me the most hopeful. Is there there are projects that they have going on, and um, I'll also uh, second the three and four plex discussion. I think is going very well. Um, that's exciting to see developers potentially having uh, less red tape in front of them to bring units online faster. Thank you, and I think you're the only one that didn't get this question earlier. Meg is in here to ask it, but I'm going to ask it for her. <clears throat> Essentially, if you had your own magic wand and could pull the trigger on one immediate policy change, what would you do to achieve better results in the housing market? Um, it would be a policy that would address, um, that would make it a requirement to um, look at housing affordability when it comes to improvement standards for subdivisions or site development. So currently what happens is you submit a plan application and planning department sends it out to uh, traffic and private development and they review it, they respond with uh, improvement requirements, whatever they may be, and planning says, okay, these are the improvement requirements uh, of your plan. And I think they have the leeway to look at that and say, well, yes, the road already exists. It's strip paved. Maybe you don't need curb. Maybe you don't need sidewalk. Maybe you don't need street lights every 100 feet. And make a determination that the standard that's there is fine for the application. Um, but I think they need a policy that allows them to really do that. Um, there has been discussion of a rational nexus. Um, it was that phrase was actually brought up on a meeting earlier this week. And so I think a policy that helps uh, reinforce that, that idea is very important because it relies on us, the, um, the petitioner, the developer, to really push the monetary side of the discussion. Historically, that's never been acceptable. Every time you submit a variance, their first position is, well, money's not an object in this discussion. And it's like, well, great. What, what are we doing here then, right? So it, thankfully, it's being pushed more to the front of the discussion and being more of a priority. But I think a policy in place that says, hey, you know, when somebody comes in to subdivide something on the south end of Rovina, maybe we look at housing affordability as part of this, a, a part of this application. <laughs> Thank you. So kind of redevelop, re redefining housing affordability instead of cost. It's interesting. And then can you please define for us what you mean by rational nexus? Uh, the term rational nexus has generally been applied to, um, say, when somebody uh, submits a flat application and the offsite improvements to the property, not, not internal to the development, but running up to the property um, and the city says, 
hey, you need to put in, you know, a million dollars worth of upgrades. If those upgrades surpass a 10% cost to the project as a whole, that's considered beyond the rational nexus of a reasonable request. Now, the 10% number isn't written in Title 21. However, it's been used in the past. Uh, the term rational nexus is in Title 21, but I think putting an actual number to it would be helpful uh, when we get into the, the code volleys back and forth with staff. It'd be helpful to have that in there. Thank you. And I just would note also, we've been joined at least for a bit by Matt Matthews, who I understand is also a developer in town. So, um, I guess we have a little bit more time. I would say we'll go one more time through. Anything else you want to tell us from your perspective as a builder, developer, participant in the community? And then I didn't have any questions from members. So um, if there are any questions. So if we roll through, go ahead and start, Tyler. Yeah, I think on that third question was, was kind of like your magic wand or, you know, what would you change? So we'll keep going on that. Um, uh, I mean, if it's not obvious, I'm asking you to get rid of the multifamily design standards. Um, uh, I'm asking to get rid of major site plan review processes for, for residential development. When we redid uh, zoning code in, uh, in, in the mid-2014 uh, area, uh, we struck design standards from commercial development. And the, the, uh, the rationale at the time was, uh, well, we're, we're not going to build bad commercial development. That was literally the, that was the argument. Uh, so we put it on the residential side, uh, and there weren't a lot of people in the room to push back. That's why we have residential design standards. Um, I would say the site plan review thing is a big deal. If you can handle any of that administratively and by right, I mean, when we've got, no offense, Nolan, but when we've got the economists in the room talking about entitlements and, and leading a class on how to get housing through without creating difficult entitlement processes, I think it's a no-brainer of where we should go. Um, to reduce some of that cost. Then what I throw out is landscaping. Uh, we have a lot of landscaping requirements. And I don't know about you all, but like after this year, uh, my landscaping doesn't look very good. Uh, it's got sand on it. It's had a lot of snow sitting on it. It's a lot of cost and it's very, very highly technical. I'm not saying to strike it all, but I think we could simplify it quite a bit. Two others, um, incentives. Uh, really appreciate what Mike is bringing to the table at ACBA. Um, the, legislation that was moving through the state uh, on sort of giving us more ability to um, control things ourselves, unfortunately did not move uh, move out of committee. So, so fixing kind of the ability to do tax abatement, that's gonna take all of us reaching out to all of our legislators because I think there are, like, there are people in other parts of Alaska that have very different reasons to not support it. it has nothing to do with what we're trying to do. Uh, and then finally, like, you know, funding. Uh, I love hearing about data as a example for mezzanine or patient capital or kind of that longer term capital. Um, I heard from Assemblymember Myers they need to look at different funding sources. The bottom line is some of this stuff just flat out costs money. And we know that, we know it costs money to do, we know it costs money to make that investment to be able to get the stuff on the tax rolls. Um, so I think we need to be creative and we need to tell the story right for the general public of why we're doing it, because it's not on its face a popular thing to do. Thanks. Thank you. So I'll just two comments on that. Um, that awful new parking lot that is kind of two lots from Club Paris, they were required to put in a little um, landscaping element and it's all just it's gone. It's like just a waste of cement. We do the same thing for a residential road project. I mean, we, we are not committed, private sector, public sector, to maintaining what we require. So it's, it's awfully sad. And, you know, this it cost money thing, I think we saw a really good juxtaposition, like with your projects, the, I guess it's lot, block 96, that massive investment we made. And then when we're looking, and that's in market rate, private apartments that are going to be rented forever by one company to the benefit of one business. And then we have a discussion about the Mount McKinley building, which is trying to figure out a way to make affordable units in a workforce and going to support the downtown workforce environment. We don't have money for it. And the investment is hard because we made it on this other project. And so I think that really does kind of call us to have a policy 
on how and why we make these investments that's beyond simply because we can get some housing first. What are the causes we're going to make some investments for the country? But with that, Mike, any last comments? I would just comment on the block, you know, the block 96 project. It was, it's an excellent project. And, and, and over the term of that lease on the land, we will make money as a city because we will collect property taxes because we took a blank piece of property and we turned, we built something on it that didn't exist before. And so there is a return for the city that's, that's not, that it goes past that, um, helps, I guess, bridge that, bridge that gap. It's the fact though that, you know, ACDA doesn't have an unlimited checkbook. We don't get, you know, the funding, or we self-generate the funding. And so that particular kind of a model, unless we're able to come back to the assembly or the city every year and get money for specifically for development, which we have some ideas for. But so, so I think that, that um, trying to find the right model to be able to do those kinds of projects is what we need to do. And we don't know until we, we go after them like we can. Um, and, you know, we may end up figuring out a way to, to bridge the gap on the McKinley project. But, you know, it, it may not be all workforce housing, you know, and that's the hard part about it. So when you look at that project, because we ran the numbers as STRs, and it does okay as STRs, you know, it, it pencils, right? And then we ran the numbers as assisted living, and it pencils for sure. But then we don't have any workforce component down there, which is what that area really needs, which is workforce housing because of the restaurants there at the 49th State and everybody that's right there. So so we're not giving up. But lastly, I would want to say that, you know, um, in terms of changes that you guys can make, I think that the assembly, that this body can help with, I think I just want to put in a pitch for the infrastructure bank. We're going to come back to you. We're going to come with that to you for an idea for an infrastructure bank, and we're going to need your support because I think that's something that um, that will help us develop more housing. You know, we can't control the cost of wood, we can't control the cost of labor, we can't control the cost of transportation. There are a lot of things we can't control in this equation. And so I think that we should spend our energy and focus on those things we can control. And that's why we're trying to do the study to find policies from outside so that we can bring those to you to try to legislate a solution. Um, but we can't do anything about a lot of the costs. And so I don't think the solution is just throwing money at it. But providing an infrastructure bank, something where the subdivision and included, for example, the city finances, the water and the sewer and the connection to the property, and then they take care of the drops, we're the ones who are going to benefit from that infrastructure for the next hundred years. The city, as well as the residents benefiting from the fact that we're going to build 1,300 new homes, as well as the fact that we're going to create 1,300 new property taxpayers where they didn't exist before. So it's really a financial problem when you look at an infrastructure bank. And I think that's a big portion. I could ask the bills for some room. I'm not a builder, but if you didn't have to pay for your water, sewer, and all of those kinds of things, that would go a long way helping you bridge that gap. And so um, I don't know if I told you yet, but I'm all supportive of an infrastructure bank. But <laughs> thanks, that's all I have. Thanks, and just a, a note on the McKinley building, when that finally does come around, there will have to be some sound um, sanctuary there because it's between bars and so any use in which people are going to go in there they have to know up front that they are going to have the ability to have quiet through the morning but um mr cross put himself in the queue thank you you know as we as we stretch out as we use up our usable land you know um the district two Cherokee river has lots of steep slopes and so uh, I've heard from developers some of the challenges with, you know, you, you think about lot size minerals, it's really easy when we're talking about a flat lot. But when we start getting the slope ground, which is quite a bit, it could be developed. But there are significant restrictions. Um, an example I just had, and he's not here today, but Craig Bennett from S4 was saying he's got a 50 acre parcel they won't even allow one house on. And so I'm curious on if you've recognized or is there anything that you can point to or what would be the process to go back and readdress the steep slope issue um, to, to see if some of the technology, technological changes and advancements in, in uh, on-site septic systems and wells and stuff, whether or not we're, we're still too restrictive on that slope issue, 
but I also recognize that we're talking about erosion concerns and everything, so there's special considerations that go into slope dirt, but there's quite a bit of land that we have out there on the hillside and the river that is not being developed because of the restrictions on steep slope. Is that just something we're just, nothing we can do about it now, or do you, can you contribute to any kind of ways that we can resolve some of those issues? Thank you. I don't know if that question was to me, but I'll take a swing at it. Well, either you or Andre, since you deal with directly or anybody that has any contribute, it's kind of a specialized field, so I don't know if it's... Well, I, I don't know if it's a cop-out to say just a common-sense approach. You know, you can't take the onesies and twosies of, of lots and throw geotechnical report, reports at them, slope stability requirements at them, and all these other very restrictive requirements. I mean, if you look at the, the steep slope section in Title 21, it's like four pages long. And God forbid your lot falls into one of those things because it's going to be a crazy path to get it to an approval. Administrative reviews and all sorts of that kind of stuff. Um, we haven't been involved with too many of them. Those are more of the builders um, uh, type of deals. So I would defer to Andre for a better solution. But um, I, I personally know that when we get, when the civil engineer gets pulled in, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, that adds a lot of money to, to the price of the home and there can be a better mousetrap and what it is exactly I'm not sure yet but there just needs to be some some common sense getting from A to B and not just having a laundry list of things you can't do uh, like the 50 acre lot with no with no uh, residential permit is a perfect example this just doesn't make sense to me there's got to be a solution there yeah I'll just add that uh, and this applies to steep slopes and the hillside in general Currently in Title 21, uh, hillside lots are, own, are have a minimum size of 40,000 square feet, and that's directly tied to the size lot that you could put a septic system on. Um, during the time, this was kind of set up before we had Advantech septic systems. This wouldn't make anybody very popular with the hillside folks, but now we have Advantech septic systems. I put in Advantech septic systems on 6,000 square foot lots. I built a duplex, and two, two units, six bedrooms on a septic system on a 6,000 square foot lot. These, these septic systems are high tech and they can, they perform better and they're in, in a smaller footprint. So when it comes to the hillside and steep slopes, there's a lot of changes we can make if we want to. And uh, I think you can appro appropriately build on half-acre lots on the hillside. That, yeah, I mean, the hillside district plan doesn't call for that, and they would push back uh, immensely. But there's a lot of things like that that could be changed if we're talking about increasing housing. Let me follow up. Yeah, and, and it's not just hillside. Trugiac, Birchwood, Eagle River Valley, you know, they... They specifically wrote in that if you go to our community councils, they say they wanted large, they wanted they wanted sprawl. They didn't want anything smaller. And the challenge that we have now, and the, the, the fierce conversation that I have with assembly members, you say, well, you also complain because there's not enough teachers moving up here because you can't afford a place to live. You also complain because your snow removal isn't getting done because we're short on diesel mechanics, the fish equipment, and everything. And so you're driving off the working class by not allowing for density, but at the same time, you're saying you don't want density. And that's a tough conversation for us to have as a civil nervous because I can't help you if you're not part of the solution. And, you know, and so they want density, they just, just not here. And I said, well, then where? And that's a fierce conversation we got to have. Thank you. Yeah, Kevin needs to tap into some really good stuff there. And um, I, I recall a conversation across the dais once where somebody said that this group has been working to keep these large lots since 1974. <laughs> uh, working in policies that were based in 1974. And it's, it's interesting how slow some things change. Um, in the queue, we have Ms. Broad Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, first, a comment. I also strongly support the idea of, of publicly funding public infrastructure. I think that's a great, uh, whether it's the infrastructure bank or other ideas. Um, and just to note, too, you know, there's there's building new places, but I think the the issues that you brought up, including uh, Tyler and your Cook Inland has faced, is, um, you know, there's still uh, houses in Spinard on Wells. I mean, there's plenty of other places around town. Um, so even though we're in the city, 
we should also be thinking about places where um, those are barriers and um, it's not just the edges of town. <laughs> it's not places that we would assume are on wells. Um, but my question is actually a different one. Um, we talked a little bit about mobile homes, which I understand, you know, when we talk about mobile homes, we're talking about um, units that were built in the 1970s or earlier and like, you know, what we would call trailers. There's also manufactured housing, which members always held brought up and there's a much broader spectrum and is, you know, prefab homes, modular homes, all those other things. I know it's a challenge because most of those things are not manufactured here, or maybe none of them are, so they have to get transported up. But I just wondered from your guys' perspective, um, do you see manufactured housing as an opportunity to reduce the cost of building or, or does that also cause issues? And I'm saying the big picture manufactured housing. Uh, yeah, my answer is maybe. I mean, you have two issues. One is you have, like Forest Park, you have um, existing manufacturing home or mobile home communities where the infrastructure is failing, uh, where they can be closed, really, uh, notwithstanding in the winter time at any given time. They have units that likely can't be moved. There's no other options. You have kind of crazy predatory lending. You have all kinds of issues there. Uh, you also have, when we rewrote the code, we, we basically made it impossible to ever build a new manufactured housing community. Uh, I think we established minimum lot sizes of eight units an acre. We made them a conditional use process. We made all of these things very intentionally be barriers to not be able to make new mobile home parks. Uh, so first step would be, you know, I really understanding is it viable? Can you get a home shipped up here for $120,000? What does it cost? You know, can, what does it cost to install, you know, get it to the site, infrastructure, all that. And that's a, that's a, that's a exercise probably worth having if you have a site, you know, someone has a site in mind. Uh, but then it would be changing those uh, those codes. Some of those codes are also, um, there's an issue of whether it's on a permanent foundation or not, and whether you can get financing for it if it's not on a permanent foundation, or whether it's then classified as personal property. There's all, there's all sort of unique issues. Uh, imagine it gets more expensive if you put it on a permanent foundation. Does it need to be? What's the point of it? Is it you know, what is it for? Uh, I think we should be exploring all housing options. My last thing, if you have a switch on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to um, sort of echo Member Cross's comments. And I, I would just say, you know, that thinking of we want density, just not near us, is not unique to the hillside or to Eagle River or to these sort of more outer parts of town. It's even in the urban core. Um, and so, you know, I think that we we do need to have a conversation um, with ourselves, but also with the community, and just decide what type of gentle density are we going to embrace. Um, so I, I appreciate bringing that. And I would argue it actually really needs to be led by people whose main constituencies live in those environments that have the large lots with the high temperatures. But that's just a thought. Okay, I think that we're just going to call it good and we're going to have a break until the top of the hour. I say thank you to the panelists. And when we come back, we'll be hearing from Michael Fredericks and we'll be having a true facilitated conversation as opposed to me being the microphone jockey. And it um, should be a pretty interesting conversation to close out the day.